position for that and turn and then they'll leave it and then the tree. that in your write-up, what were some things that you noticed that I tried to do to um, get Callie out of a tight space? Um, what did I do to not trigger her? She was mostly reactive to dogs, but remember she was reactive to me at first. Were there some body language, was there some body language in there that you saw that Callie was giving towards me that at first I giggled about, but recording myself realizing some things. So what would you, um, so a couple of things. What did you notice throughout the video? What could have been different? Um, and then I'm gonna give you about 15 minutes to write out how you would uh, go ahead and uh, create a design or a safety environment for Callie and her training. Um, and then we're gonna come back and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Callie and how uh, we are doing things differently now. <laughs> Okay, so Callie is a really interesting, um, at first this, this training video worked really well. She was taking huge strides, but we got to a certain point where she was really plateauing. So I um, ended up bringing in Dr. Volley, who works for Behavior Synergy, um, and we ended up putting Callie on a slight medication protocol. So Callie got so, we got her to a certain point with her training, but her uh, anxiety kind of took over after a while. And so about, we gave her about three to six months to really get a nice uh, medication protocol. And now Kelly's working with me again. I put Kelly in the same situation just about a week ago and she just fell apart. So those environmental things that maybe at one point triggered her or didn't trigger her, um, just she need, we're trying something completely new now, which is why I'm bringing this up, is that you're throughout a dog's training plan that you have with them, if it's for years, if it's just a couple of weeks, I need you to realize that it's going to change. Um, sometimes it's not going to be stuffed dogs. Sometimes it's not going to be in a city setting in an empty parking lot. Sometimes it's um, where we're heading now is we're training at Gabriel Park. The city sounds and things like that are too much for Callie. So we go to a, a park where we work around other dogs and we work around people and she's able to walk past me, she's able to do a touch, she's able to walk past other dogs. But this was the evolution of Callie and this was something that last year's students I didn't even mention because this is something brand new to Callie that we're trying now. So in your write-up, um, you know, if you want to tweak it a little bit after the second part of me talking about Callie, just remember that it'll change. You know, you, you may have written, hey, you should have maybe gone to a, a park or maybe you should have gone to the apartment or maybe, you know, it will change over time and the dog will change over time and you just are gonna have to kind of ride that wave and always putting safety first, okay? Okay, so I found some kind of random videos on the internet that I thought were really interesting that were good to kind of talk about safety first. So uh, the case study is the news anchor. <laughs> so this. Uh, is a pretty famous video of a news anchor who is going to uh, get almost bit by a do uh, dojo argentino. So in your write-up, I want you to kind of think about what are the signs that you see in this video? What do you see? What is the dog displaying? What is the dog showing? What, what, what are you seeing from the dog that is all the, knee, the red, red flags pretty much that the dog is going to do what it, it ends up inevitably doing? And what would you change about the news anchor's body language? What exactly was the news anchor doing that maybe could have provoked all of this anxiety? Um, so that's something I want you to kind of consider as well that, you know, we talk about a lot, a lot about environmental cues, but what are we doing that's causing the dog to be anxious? Um, I'm sure in that video with Callie previously, I was staring at her with the phone and when she was kind of going like this, staring at me back and I was laughing, 
And that's, a, you know, looking back on that, those were signs of like, I'm not sure about you, I'm not sure about you. And looking back on it, um, which is why I always videotape myself for safety reasons, um, is I can kind of see, oop, Erin, you should have told mom to give her a treat while she was kind of looking at me and almost questioning me at the same time. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the news anchor. And once again, let's go ahead and do a nice write up of these two questions. Okay, so interesting video. <laughs> but what are some things that you saw in that video? What was the dog doing? What were the subtle hints the dog was giving away? What were the what was something that the anchor was doing? What would you have done differently? Um, let's go ahead and take the next 15 minutes and let's do a nice write-up. Okay, let's go ahead to the next case study. So we're, the case study is titled The Baby. <laughs> I'm sure this could be uh, depicted as something, you know, much crazier than it might be, but um, just simply, what signs, point blank, do you see that the dog is uncomfortable? Um, let's go ahead and watch the video. We'll do the write-up and we'll come back to talk about it. So in that video, sorry if that was hard for anybody to watch, it always startles me at the end, um, but what were the signs that the dog was giving? They were subtle, but in this class we are, I am here to teach you all about those subtle signs. Um, so what were some things the baby was doing? And in your write-up, what should the mom have been doing? Um, really there, what, what should, when should she have intervened? Uh, how should she have gone about that situation instead of yelling at the dog at the end? Um, so let's go ahead and take that time and, um, and do that right up. Okay, so this is just a video I found online. Um, I don't have a ton of, uh, other than Chewy, the dog that we talked about in class one, I only have just a couple of videos that I wanted to show of my own, but I found these interesting videos all over the internet. So um, the man and the dog. What are all the signs you see that the dog is uncomfortable? What is the man doing that is making the dog more uncomfortable? So really here, what, the theme I'm trying to really portray here is it, this, it takes two to tango in these situations. You could be blatantly adding to the dog's stress. So what, um, so it, so what, what do you need to do differently? How do you need to go about things? How should you approach a dog? Um, let's go ahead and watch the video and we'll come back. There are dangerous animations used by the party to the power. Come on, let's be all spies. <laughs> I don't think this is a lens to my spine. Get on the pills of beauty, veils, my hands are smiling. So I feel it in my soul. Get out to my spine. I can't wait. Silence to my spine. Get out of my spine. I got to my spine. Boys, I use my spine. Get out of my spine. to watch just because they laugh at the end and I get so angry <laughs> um, so there is so much wrong in this video uh, basically if you learn anything from this class just don't do anything from that video <laughs> um, so there are a ton of signs the dog is showing um, that I'd like you to be able to write about what exactly could you you know could you break down for me what are the sign what is all what are the body language signs that the dog is, is showing to this person and what is he what boundaries is he crossing how is he going about things um, that he basically shouldn't be um, and so in your write-up I just really want you to break down what the dog was trying to say quote unquote and what the human was really pushing in that aspect okay let's go ahead and take the next 15 minutes and write the write-up Okay, you guys, so welcome back. And just remember, the biggest thing I want you to take from today is that I want you to set yourself up for success. So let's go ahead back to that original slide. This one. Before you even meet a client, evaluate the dog, evaluate the client, evaluate the situation. 
investigate, ask every question that you possibly can about the dog, about the client, about the state of emotional state that everybody's in. Um, so really you've got a lot, even before even meeting the client, you've got a series of, of questions and situations that you want to make sure you ask before you even put yourself in, in that situation. Before you even take the client on or before you meet the client or anything like that, are you qualified for this dog? Is this dog so aggressive that you need to, it's, this is above you. This is not your basic teenage class or your basic puppy class. You need to evaluate yourself as well. Pick the right environment for the training. Um, the environment is so essential is, you know, can they handle tight spaces? Can they handle open spaces? Can they handle you? Can they handle a stranger? You know, it's, um, there's so much that goes into it. And you, like I said, we're here to teach you all of those little aspects, but over time you'll get better at what your own protocol is. Um, come up with the, with a plan, come up with an appropriate plan for everything. So when, before, okay, you've decided you're gonna take on this client, you have sent out some paperwork, you've learned a little bit about the dog, maybe you've done a, phone, a, a preemptive phone consultation, how are you going to uh, set up everything? How is it going to feel right? How is everyone, including the client and the client dog, going to feel safe in that situation? Okay, the client comes in, you're meeting them, or you go to them, be appropriate. I, the eye contact that we talked about, not hovering over, not sticking your hand in their face. Not, I mean, just so much of your body language will say enough by maybe not even engaging at all. Cautiously assess the entire time. Cautiously just check in with the dog. Maybe not literally, but just look at the dog. How is the dog, the, what body language can you see the dog is showing? Um, throughout the consultation, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? You're constantly assessing the dog throughout the whole situation so that in every training situation, you're moving forward and not taking steps back and causing more fear within the dog or more stress within the dog. Have an emergency plan. Things are going wrong. The dog is not feeling comfortable anymore. What do you do? How do you, um, how are you going to, like I said, how are you going to have an emergency? How are you going to have the client feel safe? How are you going to have the dog feel safe? How are you going to rope it all in and not lose um, and lose the dog somehow? Um, if something goes completely haywire, the dog lunges at you, the dog's trying to bite uh, your demo dog. How are you going to talk to the client about that? How are you going to stay um, calm in that situation? You're going to stay calm because you're already going to have an emergency plan. You're already going to know what to do in that situation know how to break up a fight. Uh, in the, earlier in the class, we had Kay kind of go around and ask you a little bit about your dog fight, if you've ever had to break up a dog fight, how it made you feel, how it went, what you had to do. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about dog fights. Can you name a couple of ways to stop a dog fight? So I'm sure some of you kind of went around. Um, there's multiple ways to kind of go about it. I will say, since uh, being a person who has had to break up multiple dog fights, you know, there's a way we're going to, we can teach you. There's a way to use safety equipment and things like that. But in the moment, you just need to make sure you're safe. So a lot of the times, as many of you maybe have experienced when a dog fight breaks out, especially if you're in a shelter situation or in a daycare situation, the rest of the dogs are going to go, mo most of the time are going to go after the dog that is screaming or that is in pain or that, um, or just, they're all going to go into it in general. So a lot of the times from my personal experience, I'd like you guys to really hold on to your personal experiences. But from my personal experience, um, one of the main things I have done was just picked one of the dogs up and just gotten it, the dog right out of there. Um, I didn't necessarily kick by any means, but I'm using my knees throughout to just kind of safely get this dog out, make sure I'm not thrashing around and trying to get myself, um, sometimes if you kind of grab and, 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 and pull, then you're more likely to get bit by the dogs that are coming into the fight um, that aren't the original dogs. If you kind of go around from the back, you are more likely to get redirected from a dog that is, um, that's in the middle of a fight. So a lot of the times sounds are what's gonna help you. Um, with my dog hiking business, 
We uh, knock on wood, have hardly any dog fights, but we have air horns that we keep in our back pockets at all times, just in case. Sound is really gonna be to your benefit. Some daycares have used hoses. That can be pretty adverse at some point. So um, I know we used to have it, my original daycare, which this could be scary too, is um, we used to have a soda bottle that had rocks in it that we would drop. Um, I'm gonna go more with the air horn. <laughs> One of the doggy daycares I worked at, we had air horns hanging from all of the, um, from all of the fencing. When, and when something went broke out, we had walkie talkies, we would use a certain code, people would come out and just start dispersing the dogs. So a lot of the time, the biggest thing you need to do is ask for help. You cannot, hand, you cannot take on the situation by yourself. If you're in a position um, that you are by yourself, you shouldn't be in that position. That's all I really have to say about that. Um, so a student last year had a pretty horrific situation where she worked at a doggy daycare and she was left alone overnight. She was the overnight girl and she was left alone. This dog had come in for a, an evaluation earlier in the week and this was, and it did okay. And so this was its almost second evaluation. The girl was left, I believe, by herself and the dog just came in and she, as she recalls, and I actually know someone that works there during this situation, it was one of the worst dog fights she had ever seen. So, um, it, you know, it had gone after the other dog's throat. There was blood everywhere. She was using the hose to spray. She had tried everything. And the last resort is that she had to stick a broom handle up the dog's um, rectal area. So that is a situation where you are you have tried everything, you have gone now to the most extreme aspect of that. And the biggest thing I could say is that woman should have never been left in that situation by herself. Um, to this, when, when I had met her, when she started school last year, I, um, we re and she's actually a client of mine as well, um, we had to do a lot of confidence building with her, with her own dog even. Um, that situation had emotionally really, really, um, cause her some, some distress. Um, so really make sure when you're in these, when, when you're at a doggy daycare job or when you're at a job that is, is a lot of dogs and a lot of stress and a lot of chaos, that there's heavy protocols that you don't even need to be put into those situations. Um, so let's go right into, so not even a way, you know, not even ways to stop. Let's go right into how we shouldn't even have them. So what body language do you typically see before a dog fight happens? So the reason I, you know, knock on wood, say we don't have a lot of dog fights in my, um, at, on my hikes is because we know these dogs every single fiber of their being. I know, uh, I know who gives the whale eye. I know who gets stiff. I know who is weird with young males. I know who's weird with big dogs. I know every aspect of these dogs' personalities. Now, and in shelters, you don't unfortunately get that leisure, but you want to really get to know every little quirk about these dogs. So you're really looking at, is a dog putting a sh his uh, head over another dog's shoulder and holding it there? Is he goosing, is a, is a young dog, an adolescent dog, almost you know, provoking it to an older dog with that goosing behavior with the, you know, their heads almost pecking into their body. Um, is there a lot of tight shoulders? Is there chest coming out? Is there some whale eye happening? Is there a tight tail? Is there, um, there's so much that goes into it that you can prevent um, and it takes time, but really just even going to your local dog park, if you don't have an option to observe dogs around each other, your local dog park is gonna be one of the best places to just sit there and observe. <laughs> you're gonna see something and you might not even see the best stuff, but you're gonna see body language and you're gonna be able to assess, you know, even different breeds are gonna show different things. Um, I know my Aussie will show a different um, warning sign than my terrier will. So that's, you know, those are things too that, yes, that's to their personality, but that's also can account for their breed as well. So what can you, the biggest thing I want you to take away from here is what can you do to prevent a dog fight? You can match dogs appropriately to their personality. You can make sure you're not put, you're not, you're not put into a physically stressed situation. At doggy daycares, you shouldn't be put in with 50 other dogs um, without assistance. You, um, 
you really want to make sure if you have a dog that could be temperamental, how can you as a trainer maybe take that dog out of the group and work with it one on one with socialization? Um, do they need to attend classes before coming into the daycare? There's so much. Um, that we can learn from each other and from that discussion and each other's situations with dog fights that um, really we can prevent them from happening and you can make sure you're not in the situation where it happens. Um, really quickly, the most recent situation I was in was out on my dog hikes. I have a big mastiff. He was actually this dog right here. So this is Bruno. Um, Bruno is a, um, we think he is a um, borble. A borble mix. So he is about 120 pounds. He's the biggest dogs on our uh, the biggest dog on our hike. And every hike he is typically pretty fine. He just keeps to himself. He hikes with us nice and slow. When he gets playful, he can get a little pushy. But there is a side of Bruno that can come out that can be um, I would call it Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. So every once in a while, Bruno will find a dog that he that it, it could almost be nothing. I have broken down each this situation so many times of what it could have been. For instance, what happened, we were on a hike and we, um, during in the summer times, we bring big jugs of water and we bring pale, big metal bowls on our hikes. Um, we used to do individual bowls, but this year we wanted to try something different. So we bring these big metal bowls and we were giving everybody water and Bruno um, just, really was very thirsty that day. So he is gulping and gulping and gulping and gulping and gulping. And we had to kind of cut him off. We had to make sure, okay, let's make sure every all the other dogs get water. So we, you know, gently take the bowl from him and we try to offer it to this Portuguese water dog named Pele. And Pele wouldn't drink the water and we're like kind of following around like, come on Pele, it's hot, try and get some water. So we kind of splash his face. My thinking is that Bruno got resource guardy over the water bowl and the fact that we had somewhat taken it from him and given it to another dog he started to go up to Pele and kind of square him up so what I mean by that is he got shoulder to shoulder he got direct eye contact he got heavy whale eye and as soon as I see this I grab Bruno's harness and that could have been it as well is frustration that I had grabbed him I grabbed his harness and he just lunged and went for Pele so I am a, I weigh exactly as much as Bruno does. And so Bruno with all his might is going after this dog. I end up grabbing him by the harness. I had, you probably can't see my feet, but I ground my heels into, um, or I grind my heels into the ground and I just buckle down and I hold him. So I'm not restraining him like this because he could turn around and he could uh, redirect that and bite my face. I am holding the harness and I'm holding him back as the other hiker that I go with takes the rest of the dogs and goes down the trail. So because Bruno was lunging and screaming, I now have the rest of the dogs um, coming at him and trying to bite him and trying to tell him to, to, to somewhat stop. So I have my employee go all the way down the trail and I take Bruno back to the car. If I didn't know Bruno well enough, if I didn't know, if I, um, didn't see those little signs of the whale eye and the shoulders and the square up and knowing it's two males, I could have caused a dog to have been drastically hurt. Uh, Bruno is a huge dog. So as you can see, he's got a huge mouth. <laughs> so um, that was something that I, you know, I did cry afterwards because I didn't really think about the water, water bowl situation until afterwards. I thought to myself, what could it have been? We were just all hiking. It was no big deal. What could it have been? But the water bowl just happened minutes before. And this is what you have to do. You can't beat yourself up. You prevented it. Nobody got hurt, but you have to uh, cautiously assess be appropriate, have an emergency plan. So after that situation, we got more air horns uh, because we didn't have them at the time and know if they were to have been fighting, what could you have done? So instead of my sticking my hand into near Bruno's mouth or near his head, I grabbed the harness and just buckled down and pulled him back. My emergency plan was to have my employee take the dogs to the end of the trail. Okay, so that's just one situation that I've been put in. I know that you guys have kind of went around and talked about yours, but just know that you can prevent them um, and that there's safety equipment 
that there's safety equipment that um, is in place that can help you. Air horns, um, harnesses versus collars, um, things like that, okay? So one last thing before we close out for today and we talk a little bit more about your homework. What, how do we handle a hurt dog? So hurt, uh, you can have the nicest dog in the world and your, if your dog has fallen and broken a leg from a hike or if a dog has sliced its paw open from some glass um, in the city, your dog could bite you. <laughs> it's, it's hurt, it's scared, it's anxious, it's maybe even a bit in shock. Um, so we, you need to think safety first. Um, uh, Trisha from Trailblazing Tales teaches an amazing pet, sit, uh, pet first aid course and something I learned was to always keep a, either a vet either vet rack with me a piece of cloth but to make a makeshift muzzle so yes we do carry muzzles in our backpacks but if it's just you leisurely walking in the woods and you don't think to have that um, you need to know how to make something safe so that you if you if your dog has broken its leg you can pick it up if your dog has sliced its paw you can get you can ask to see the paw without putting yourself in a uh, unsafe situation um, and making sure that your uh, head is not near their mouth. And so we're gonna go over, I'm gonna show you a video on kind of how to make that um, and how we're gonna go over just that type of safety if a dog is hurt. The other thing, if a dog is hurt and you're not out on the trail and you have access to tools, you need to assess how do you need to put its harness on and pick it up that way. Do you, um, the biggest thing and right off the bat is just don't get in its face, don't go near its mouth. You know, um, just like with horses, how they tell you to kind of put your hand and walk all the way around the horse. Let your dog know what you're what you're going to be doing. So um, the biggest thing to prevent that right off the bat, the bat is body work and to teach your clients to do body handling. You have a chin rest, have a paw, have let them, you know, teach them that they have back paws. Teach them that, you know, that you are going to dig your hand in sometimes, that you are going to put your thumb. Every, you know, so many clients come to me and say, Oh yeah, I stick my, I touch her all the time and I stick my hands in her ears and I put my fingers in between her paws and that's great, but we need to start going above and beyond that. We need to start having cues for paws, cues for chins, cues for ears, you know, and it's important that as dog professionals, we advocate for the dogs and we educate owners. It's, it's so much more than just sticking your thumb in the dog's ear and making sure that you can stick your fingers in between its paws. Um, so that's one of the biggest things is that if a dog was physically hurt, A, obviously stay away from its mouth. Do you need to make a makeshift muzzle? Do you have access to a muzzle? Last but not least, muzzle train the dogs. It's always part of my protocol when meeting a client, especially a puppy, um, to have some muzzle training involved. Have the dog comfortable in a muzzle. Have the dog want a not so, if the dog is un, um, is not comfortable in a muzzle, you're gonna make the situation more stressful by just slapping a muzzle on it as soon as it has a, a, a busted toe or something. So, um, so that's one thing to really think about uh, when thinking about if the dog is physically hurt and how to handle that situation, okay? Okay, you guys, so today we went over a lot. We talked about how to assess the situation, how to keep yourself safe, how to have a safe, and tra a safe training environment. We went over some case studies. Um, and we also talked about dog fights and we talked about how to handle a dog that is hurt. So let's go ahead and talk about some of your homework. So first off, I would like you to send me all of your write-ups from today. We will be discussing them um, next class, just going over them as a group, as a bit of a discussion. And then we're gonna go ahead and, and so I'd like you to send all of those write-ups uh, and everything from Callie to the man with the dog to the baby um, and just kind of your thoughts on all of those. Um, and then uh, by next class, your video project is going to be due. So I would like you to tape yourself or to video yourself or have someone videotape you greeting a dog. You can mock this situation. You could literally go to a public place and, and videotape yourself, but the only rule is the dog cannot be yours and the dog cannot be a dog that knows you very well, such as a friend's dog or anything like that. You don't necessarily have to do a strange dog, but maybe a client dog, a dog at the shelter, um, just like I said, a dog that you don't have a strong history with. Um, and the second part of the video project, I'd like you to videotape yourself handling and restraining a dog in the proper ways that we have gone over. Now, 
We are going to demo all of this stuff next week. Right now, we've just kind of talked about it. So next week, we're going to practice with real dogs handling and restraining them. We're also gonna be practicing how to greet a dog. We're gonna practice greeting a dog that's nervous. Uh, we're gonna practice a dog um, that's overly confident and a dog that can be a bit anxious as well. So we are also gonna do a case study of a deaf and blind dog and how we would, go at, how we would greet a dog like that as well. So your homework is due the third week of this class, which is July 16th. I will be back in with uh, teaching your sessions, so you're not going to have to see much more of my video <laughs> recording of myself. Um, and the easiest way to send that is through email. If you're having trouble, we can share it through Google Drive. Uh, last year I had multiple ways that people, we, you can upload it onto Moodle, um, the, the program we use here. But uh, if you are having trouble, just go ahead and contact me directly with the contact information I gave you in first class, and we can go ahead and talk about uh, how to get that over. So that is class for us today. So just remember um, the key points that we talked about, and um, have a great week, every guys. Every day, have a great week, you guys, and we'll go ahead and see you next week.